It's The Real News. I'm Aaron Maté. We're continuing our discussion with the author and scholar Norman Finkelstein about the 50th anniversary of the 1967 war. Norman, in this part, let's get to the period since, the um, legacy of the 67 war in terms of uh, its geopolitical impact. So let's start with the fact that after 67, Israel then becomes a strategic asset of the U.S. inside its orbit. Yeah, after 67, well, as we already discussed, radical Arab nationalism, as it was called, radical Arab nationalism, had now suffered a mortal defeat. It disappeared from the scene, uh, never to be heard from again. Uh, the Arabs seemed to be a defeated people, and Israel and the United States now carried on as if you don't have to take into account or give any heed to the opinions of Arabs. They were defeated. Um, and that in turn uh, get, uh, caused a certain element of arrogance among the Israelis and the Americans. Uh, when, Na when Nasser passes from the scene in 1970, He's replaced by Anwar Sadat. And Sadat already in 1971, uh, there was a peacekeeping, uh, 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 a, a peace envoy appointed by the UN uh, named Gunnar Yaring. And Yaring is trying to negotiate some sort of settlement of the Israel-Palestine conflict in terms of the dimensions that endured, namely the occupations. Israel as a state was now a done deal. After 1967, the issue of whether Israel as a state has now been vanished from the, interna has vanished from the international agenda. It's established itself. As the Israeli diplomat Shlomo Ben-Ami said, the main result of 1967 was it established the borders of 1949. In the sense that Israel grabbed more territory in 67, and so the world says you can have the territory you had before in 48, but not what you took in 67. Exactly. Israel ceased to be a political issue. What now became the issue was the various occupations of the Sinai, the Golan Heights, and the West Bank and Gaza. The uh, Sadat had already agreed during the Yaring mission uh, to a peace treaty with Israel in exchange for a full Israeli withdrawal from the Egyptian Sinai. And Yaring sent out a questionnaire to all sides, where do you stand? I actually went through the record. I was the first one. I had to declassify from the United Nations because I was curious. And Israel gave its famous remark when it was asked uh, whether you will return to the 67 border. That was one of the questions. It replied, we will not return to the 1967 border. And that killed the Yaring mission. Uh, and then afterwards, Sadat kept saying, I'm going to attack. I'm going to attack. I'm going to attack. Now, it's often said that 1973, what's sometimes called the Yom Kippur War, it was a surprise attack. What well, was actually the most broadly announced surprise attack, probably in the history of the world, he kept saying for two years, if you don't return I'm to the 60, uh, if you're not going to return to Sinai, I'm going to attack. And then come October 1973, he attacks. After he attacks, the U.S. enters the picture in a big way because now Egypt has shown itself to be a significant fighting force. Because they made some gains in that war of 73. Uh, yes, they it almost, was. Uh, they came even, close. Uh, even, uh, Diane, uh, excuse me, um, Abba Eben in his memoir, in a very understated way, but you could see the, he was impressed, he said. It was an impressive attack. It was. Mm -hmm. It was. Um, and then uh, Carter enters the picture in 19, when he's elected in 76, and Egypt is uh, 
uh, Egypt, uh, Israel withdraws from the Sinai in uh, they agree in 78 and then 79 to 81. And then the outstanding issues are the Golan Heights, the Syrian Golan Heights, and the West Bank and Gaza. Already by the mid-1970s, the Palestinians were ready to accept a state in the West Bank and Gaza. Sometimes people ask, oh, why are you rehashing the history? Who cares about what happened in the 1970s? But in fact, it is important because you can't understand what happens afterwards. Let's take one critical example. 1982, June 1982, Israel likes to make wars in June. Uh, this was June 6th, 1982. Israel attacks Lebanon. It was a brutal attack. Israel killed, the estimates are, between 15 and 20,000 Lebanese and Palestinians, overwhelmingly civilians, between June 82 and September 82, when the best known of the killings occurs, the Sabra and Shatila massacre. So now you're wondering, what does this have to do with anything? It's a very interesting fact. Why did Israel attack Lebanon in 1982? Well, the official reason that, that, that we're told is that uh, PLO guerrillas in Lebanon were, were shelling uh, yes. nor northern Israel. Firing Katusha rockets at Israel. What's the real reason? The real reason is perfectly obvious if you look at the Israeli scholarship. So you take the most mainstream of Israeli political scientists, Avner Yaniv. He writes a book called Dilemmas of Security. He since passed away. What does he say? He says the Palestinians, they want to uh, establish a state in the West Bank and Gaza. They've accepted two states. Now this is a disaster for Israel because its pretext for not withdrawing is we have no one to negotiate with. But now the PLO is saying we're ready to negotiate. So Israel now has to knock out the PLO. Why? Why? It's interesting, the expression that Avner Yaniv uses. He says it's because of the Palestinian peace offensive. The Palestinians are being too moderate. And if they're too moderate, we don't have a pretext for maintaining the occupation. And so it casts 1982 in a very different light. There were no Katusha rockets being fired from uh, southern Lebanon into Israel. We know for a fact from July 1981 when a, a, um, uh, a, uh, a what is it called when you have a, you not, you got, you not a ceasefire? Oh, yeah. And from July 1981, there is a ceasefire, and the PLO honored the ceasefire for the whole year. And Israel, and, meanwhile, kept showing. And then right, Israel to started get a to show, yeah, started to show, yeah. trying to evoke, to provoke, so we'll have an excuse yeah. to go into Lebanon. Why? To defeat the Palestinian peace offensive. The history is important to understand what happened. And the same thing happened over and over again in Gaza. In 2008, there's a ceasefire between Gaza and Israel. And Israel's own official intelligence agency, I'm quoting it, it says, Hamas was careful to honor the ceasefire. But Israel had the same problem. Hamas it coincides with too, Hamas at least tacitly yeah, accepting the two-state solution. Being too moderate. And on that point, of course, the harshest consequences fall to the Palestinians uh, in the West Bank and Gaza, who now live under occupation. Can you talk a bit about the uh, legacy of that, the 50 years of life under occupation? Well, it's, you know, it's impossible to speak in a short period about uh, the legacy. W what you can say is, there were ample opportunities along the way to end the occupation and find a reasonable resolution of the conflict. From the Palestinian point of view, it was not going to be wholly satisfactory, that's for sure, because there is a right 
and I'm not going to dispute that right, uh, the right of return of refugees to territory from which they were either expelled or fled in the time of war, refugees are allowed to return after... In 1948. Uh, yeah, the cessation. Yeah. And also, there were 300,000 uh, Arabs expelled in 1967. Um, so, uh, it wouldn't have been a perfect resolution, but there had been possibilities. Uh, and Israel, uh, it's a combination of the Israeli arrogance, but you have to add it's the arrogance compounded by uh, a powerful lobby uh, in the United States, the Jewish lobby, which um, very few presidents are willing to buck unless a critical U.S. interest is at stake. Like the Iran nuclear deal. Yes, like the Iran nuclear deal. It's interesting how little the proponents of this claim that the Israel lobby is all powerful, mm -hmm. there is a large school of thought that believes that, how little they had to say about the Iran deal. Yeah. Because Netanyahu, AIPAC, they were 100% against the deal. It passed. But where a critical U.S. interest is not at stake, and the occupation is one of those instances, where critical U.S. interest is not at stake, then the lobby is very powerful, and the lobby has played an extremely destructive role in preventing a reasonable resolution of the conflict. Because, why, that, because why otherwise would the U.S. let it go on for exactly, so long? Exactly. Yeah. They, they have no stake yeah. in it. What, what, the, the, if, if, say, tomorrow uh, the Israelis announced, we're going to pack up and leave, we're going to go back to the 67 border. Yeah. We're leaving. Would the American administration lament? No, and, and their Gulf Arab at, um, allies would be thrilled right. because it, it, it removes a headache. Of so, that, yeah. so then you have to ask yourself, then why is the U.S. government giving Israel such uncritical backing? And there's only one answer, and it's the lobby. Well, there could be more complex factors like just fidelity with another colonial uh, there's state. There's no, you know, as they say, there's no friendship between states. There's only interests. Okay. All right. Well, listen, let's get to a point that you raised earlier as we wrap, which is mm -hmm. that there have been opportunities to end this conflict. Because I imagine somebody will, will hear your words today and say, okay, fine. Let's say he's right about 67, that it was not a defensive war, mm -hmm. um, that Israel did occupy those lands deliberately. Uh, they will say, though, that, and this is a part of the official history that we talked about earlier, mm -hmm. um, that Israel has offered Palestinians what they lost in 67. And it's been Palestinians' refusal to accept Israel's generous offers, which included returning uh, the West Bank and Gaza to, to the Palestinians. That, that's the reason why there's no peace today. And so on that point, let me play a couple of clips for you, okay? Um, I was at the show Democracy Now! for 10 years. And one of my most memorable shows that I worked on was when you debated Shlomo Ben Ami, the former foreign minister of Israel. And here it was, you were uh, one of the most well-known critics of Israel in the world, and accordingly one of the most vilified for it, meeting with, uh, speaking with the former foreign minister of Israel. And it was striking to me how you guys basically, when it came to the historical facts, you agreed on everything, or almost everything. So let's play uh, what he said about the peace process that began uh, in 1993 with the Oslo Accords. This is Shlomo Ben Ami. Arafat in Oslo reached an agreement that didn't even mention the right of self-determination for the Palestinians, D doesn't even mention the need of the Israelis to put an end to settlements. If the Israelis, after Oslo, continued expansion of settlements, they were violating the spirit of Oslo, not the letter of Oslo. There's nothing in the Oslo agreement that says that Israelis cannot build settlements. It was, it was an exercise in make-believe. The Palestinians uh, didn't even mention self-determination, so a, a leader like Rabin could have thought that, okay, we will have an agreement that will create something which is a state minus. This, is, this was Rabin's expression. He never thought this will end in a full-fledged Palestinian state. So that's the former foreign minister of Israel, Shlomo Ben-Ami, uh, recounting uh, on Democracy Now! 
uh, that the Israeli founder of the peace process, basically, Yitzhak Rabin, never thought it would end up in a Palestinian state. Now let's go forward to uh, 2000. Uh, Shlomo Ben Ami is talking about the 2000 Camp David talks, where it's widely believed, or it's widely, uh, uh, yeah, it, it's widely believed that Israel offered Arafat and the Palestinians a very generous deal, returning basically all of the West Bank and Gaza. This is what Shlomo Ben Ami said about that that Camp David was not the missed opportunity for the Palestinians. And if I were a Palestinian, I would have rejected Camp David as well. This is something I put in the book. Norman, that was an amazing moment to me when the former foreign minister of Israel, who was actually foreign minister at Camp David when Israel made this supposed generous offer to Palestinians, said that if he were Palestinian, he would have rejected it. Well, it's an interesting thing. Just a small bit of background. Uh, I actually enjoy debating Shlomo Ben Ami, uh, even though he is a representative of the Israeli state and that comes with a lot of baggage. Uh, still, it was one of the first occasions where I engaged in a debate where nobody was calling me a liar, nobody was claiming I was inventing facts, nobody was using ad hominems like he's pro Arab uh, or pro Palestinian. Uh, he actually stuck very hard and fast to the facts. Uh, and as you said, when it came to just the facts, there was a consensus between us on all major points. The second thing is, I think he's the only one who ever admitted that about Oslo. I've had to, I've, uh, I should say about Camp David, I've uh, written a lot on it, and I have to say I make a lot of use of that quote. <laughs> because he won't see it anywhere else. It was very surprising coming from him when he said, hey, if I was a Palestinian at Camp David, I wouldn't have accepted the agreement. And the reason why it's important is because when the Palestinian Intifada broke out in 2000, and mm -hmm. you had this um, brutal Israeli campaign to quash it, <laughs> I remember reading so many op-eds in American newspapers by liberals, you know, sort of lamenting that the Palestinians hadn't accepted Israel's generous offer. So even those who, who, who didn't, you know, who, who, were, who were uncomfortable with the level of violence on Palestinians were still blaming Palestinians for it because Arafat didn't accept Israeli generosity. And that's a pretty widespread view. That was, I remember Israelis, actually, she'll probably kill me for saying this, well, the current editor of, the, uh, of Haaretz, the front page editor, a wonderful young woman. I, her mother was a friend of mine. I remember talking to her back then and she was repeating the line that Barack offered them everything. And they- Ehud Barak, the Ehud Barak, Ehud Barak was the prime minister then, and they rejected it. And she's an extremely intelligent woman. Yeah. Uh, but they all bought into that. Barack, uh, part of it, of course, was Bill Clinton's fault. Mm. Because when they went to Camp David, Ar Ar Yasser Arafat, the PLO chair, asked directly to Clinton, if we don't get an agreement, you're not gonna blame me, are you? You're not going to blame me. And Clinton because, promised him he wouldn't. Yeah, because he, yeah. Uh, Arafat didn't think there had been enough preparation. Clinton wanted a deal because he wanted to erase the blot of Monica Lewinsky. Yeah. So he, uh, he rushed to camp. He was very good. I mean, facts are facts. Clinton is a first-rate mind. He is very, sure. very fast in sure. his feet. He mastered every detail. People said he knew every street in Jerusalem by the end because you no know, Jerusalem to try to disentangle Jerusalem was very tough. But he was desperate and he made the um, promise to Arafat, I won't blame you. And then immediately after it fell apart, he blamed Arafat. And then all the propaganda went berserk blaming Arafat uh, because here was Clinton who was the neutral arbiter between Rabin, as it was portrayed, between Rabin and Arafat, if you remember on the White House lawn, Clinton is in between them. So now the neutral arbiter, the alleged neutral arbiter is saying Arafat was the cause of the collapse of Camp David. Uh, but as Ben Ami points out, that wasn't the case. The whole thing is rewritten because everybody says the second intifada, which breaks out in 2000, uh, it began with the suicide bombings. Well, no. The second intifada begins September 29th, 2000. The first suicide bombing in Israel 
comes in March. Mm. It comes five months later. What happened in the interim? What happened in the interim was a massive Israeli bloodletting. Mm -hmm. The reports are the first week, the first week of the second intifada, between September 29th and the first week in October, Israel fired one million shells. As they put it, one shell for every Palestinian child. They fired one million shells in that first week of the, of the second intifada. And the ratio of killings was like 20 to one, 20 Palestinians for each Israeli. And so it rapidly escalated into armed conflict between the two sides, but started out nonviolent. It started out in imitation of the first intifada, but the bloodletting, and the bloodletting was uh, initiated by uh, Barack, because Barack wanted a very strong reaction because he thought if we knock them out the first couple of days, they'll stop. Mm. So he was the one that initiated the bloodletting. Right, because Sharon came into power after that. Oh, yeah, he, yeah, was, right. uh, yeah, he, yeah. he came in in, uh, well, the Camp David talks continued in Taba until the end of January 2001, and that's when uh, Sharon uh, was elected the end of January 2001. After Barack calls off the Taba talks when they yeah. actually make some, but that's another that, That's another detail yes. that's so, forgotten. <laughs> let's, let's get to the present then. Mm -hmm. 50 years of occupation. Um, your advice to people on how they should view the commemorations of the, of the Six Day War, of 60, or of the 1967 mm -hmm. war, and your thoughts on what needs to happen today. I mean, we just had this massive Palestinian hunger strike mm -hmm. go on. Um, for uh, more, for close to two months, what needs to happen today to end uh, this Look, occupation? Look, it's a very tough years? moment. For the moment, the Palestinians are a defeated people. For now, in Gaza, the Hamas is loathed. It's hated by the people in Gaza, which is exactly what the United States and Israel wanted. You turn the screws enough, and the people begin to blame the government because they have no, who else can they blame? They don't know who to blame because it's, they're looking for somebody, they want a punching bag. Uh, the uh, Hamas in 2006, it was the first, the first democratic election in the whole Arab world. The first democratic election in the whole Arab world. Hamas comes to power Hillary Clinton later says, our big mistake was we should have rigged the election so Hamas didn't win. That's their commitment to democracy. And the moment they came into power, they, the US and Israel and the EU start tightening the screws, namely the blockade of Gaza. Then in 2007, they tighten the blockade even more when Hamas consolidates its power in Gaza. And then the people, the situation is awful. Hamas becomes, truth be told, it becomes very repressive. Every regime becomes repressive in those circumstances. Show me a regime that doesn't become repressive under those circumstances. And then the people turn against it. Now, if you look at the polls, it says about 70% of Gaza's youth, if they could, they would leave. They want to get out. Of course. Of course. And West Bank, it's defeated. People sacrificed. They gave their all many times. And what did they get for it? A corrupt, rotten, collaborationist regime. So they have... In the Palestinian Authority. Yeah. The, Abbas. the Palestinian Authority. So they've lost faith in politics. And there's a feeling of every man for himself. Each person tries to carve out a little niche for him or herself hoping they'll escape the collective disaster. However, I would want to end on the note that you mentioned the prisoner strike. And Israel said, when the prisoner strike began, we will not negotiate. We will not negotiate. There will be no negotiations, no negotiations. Well, they went on a hunger strike for over 40 days, the prisoners. 
Israel capitulated about 80% of the demands. So this, that's by the way, is over 1,000 Palestinians in Israeli mm -hmm. prisons uh, consuming only water and salt. And there was other cases of prisoners who went on these heroic hunger strikes. Israel said, won't negotiate, won't negotiate, it negotiates. Because Israel is very vulnerable on one front. Its big vulnerability, its Achilles heel, the chink in its armor, is international public opinion. They are very sensitive to that international public opinion. If Palestinians focus on demands which can't be impeached, their legitimacy, the Palestinian hunger strikers are very smart. They learn, they learn. They said, we're not making any political demands. We're just gonna make humanitarian demands. Increase the number of visits per month. They were only allowed, Israel had cut it down from two visits to one visit. So they want to restore two visits per month. Permission to make phone calls. They kept it to strictly humanitarian issues. And then they say, we're going to go to the death. Israel has a big problem. How do you defend that? How do you defend it? How can you defend not letting them have more than one family visit a month? That's their weakness. And if there were mass nonviolent resistance focused on unimpeachable demands, in my opinion, those which are firmly anchored in international law. So taking it back to 67, mm -hmm. a full return of the occupied territories that Israel captured 50 years ago. I would say at this point in time, that's too big a demand. I think what the Palestinian hunger strikers did was smart. You start with smaller demands, and then you gradually accumulate your power after you've demonstrated you can win. You can win. I've said many times the big demand that should be made by the people in Gaza is to end the blockade. The blockade is illegal under international law. It's immoral. It's inhuman. In Gaza right now, 95% of the drinking water, 95% is not fit for human consumption. As Sarah Roy recently wrote in the revised version of her book, The Gaza Strip, uh, she's the world's leading authority on Gaza's economy. She's at Harvard, wonderful person. She said every day mothers have to witness the fact that they're poisoning their children every time they give them anything with water. If you focused on ending the blockade, a mass nonviolent resistance to end the blockade, which does not mean ending the occupation, just ending the blockade, uh, I think it's winnable. I think those demands are still winnable. The problem is the people don't believe it anymore. Well, it's also hard to organize mass nonviolent resistance under occupation, especially it, if in the past it gets crushed violently and the world kind of it, looks it, on it's like in the hard. first thing about it. I, I will never deny it's hard. You know, it's, uh, but I, it's, as I've said many times, the uh, people of Gaza under the leadership of Hamas have tried several times using what they call rockets to defeat Israel. Uh, in 2008-9, Operation Cast Lead, to, uh, November 2012, Operation Pillar of Defense, and then the nightmare of 2014, Operation Protective Edge. They got nothing for it. In fact, they got a lot less than nothing. Operation Protective Edge, Israel left behind 2.5 million tons of rubble. 18,000 homes, 18,000 homes were pulverized. This was not collateral damage. When you read the accounts by breaking the silence, the Israeli, uh, office, uh, Israeli soldier uh, testimonies, they would go into neighborhoods one by one, rope off the neighborhoods, bring in the D9 bulldozers, and just flatten every house in the neighborhood. This wasn't collateral damage in war. This was systematic, methodical destruction. I want to just say one last thing, you know, for listeners, and even for the people here, the camera people and everyone. 
uh, let's say one night I'm working on writing something. And suddenly, I lose it. The computer crashes, right? Oh my God, I can't believe it. Two hours of work destroyed. I am, you know, cursing my faith. Where is God, you know? Gaza consists of 70% of Gaza. 70% of Gaza is refugees and children and grandchildren of refugees. 51% of Gaza is children. 51% of Gaza is children under the ages of 18. You have refugees, children. That's Gaza. When everyone envisage Gaza, say to yourself, refugees, children. They lost their homes in 19, they lost their homeland in 1967. They were expelled. That's who Gaza is. It consists of expellees from their homeland. And then, in the kind of reenactment of Attila the Hun, the Vandal hordes, this alien army comes in, and the only thing they have left is their homes. To systematically, methodically, just go in, rope off neighborhoods, 18 thousand homes, a hundred thousand people. It's so heartless, so inhuman. And I'm not saying the Israel before 67 was much better. There was a whole lot of ugliness. But the 50 years of occupation has really, it's not coarsened the population of Israel. It's really corrupted it. Norman Fickelstein, author and scholar, thanks very much for joining us. My pleasure. And thank you for joining us on The Real News. Mm -hmm.